uh, we have been discussing a lot about the bottlenecks, you know, facing the sector development and then impact impact assessment and then impact measurement have, you know, has always come up as one of the major barriers. So I think tonight it's a good opportunity for us, you know, to come together and then to discuss how we can overcome, you know, how we can overcome this barrier together. And uh, so I will share some of my uh, insights, you know, how, how we um, approach this issue. And uh, so please bear with me. And of course, you know, tonight, I understand it's evening and that we will talk about some uh, serious research methodology. So you may fall asleep, <laughs> you know, so make sure that, uh, you know, uh, right now you still have a chance to get, uh, get some drinks and to make yourself comfortable. So then we can uh, have a good discussion. So uh, without further ado, so let me start, um, let me start today's uh, presentation. Okay, um, I think it's this one. All right, I hope you see the, I hope you see the, okay, good. So, um, So right now, you know, I like to show, um, I like to do some, uh, uh, you know, survey first, and then could you please, you know, scan this QR code, and it's actually a Mentimeter uh, survey, and then you can input the code 52994766, so that I could, you know, we could discuss, um, we could know a little bit of, uh, more about your background. Thank you. We already have a question. Okay, good. Oh, so that's the first question. Okay, maybe I can share this also. So a lot of us, uh, I think a lot of us work in the service delivery NGOs and some are from charitable foundations. And we have one guest is uh, is from impact investment field. And then we have some from corporate field or, oh, okay, and social enterprise. All right, so let's wait for two more minutes or maybe one more minute. Well, a lot of participants are from NGOs, <clears throat> service delivery NGOs. Okay, without further ado, let's go to the second question. Oh, we have more answers coming in. All right. Okay, let's go. Let's go to the second, uh, second, uh, slide. So, what issues are you working on? I'm waiting for your response very impatiently. Impact measurement, use employment. I see. Yeah, we do work on. A lot of use school transformation. Wow, a lot of change in change management, elderly care, aging, family. Hmm. It seems that we have this common need. This common need is impact measurement.
Okay. So we also have a lot of people working on public sector innovation, people with disabilities, inclusion, using use and aging related issues seem to be a um two biggest issue issue areas tonight. Okay. Okay. So um the next slide. The reason why I'm asking this is because you guys are helping me to think about what kind of examples I can give in the you know in a in the coming hour. So since I think a lot of people are working on the youth empowerment, youth development, and aging related issues, and also for example, um, like uh, 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 inclusion, social inclusion, and people with disabilities. So then I will try to give more examples related to these issues. So thank you. Okay, so what do you want to learn most from today's workshop? Mm, quantify social impact, new ideas, comparing impact. Mm. impact assessment, impact creation, investment prioritization, how to measure impact. Okay. Variables to measure. Mm -hmm. Okay. No one has mentioned theory of change yet, which is actually a key concept that <laughs> related to impact measurement. What framework you use? Okay, I use theory of change framework. Hmm. Embedding impact reporting okay impact reporting measuring impacts oh it's good to know it's good to know um what everybody is is hope uh is it back expecting to learn tonight theory of change okay that's good to know any more answers Okay, last. So how well do you know research? <clears throat> qualitative and quantitative. So you can rate, you know, how well do you know qualitative research from strongly disagree to strongly agree? It seems we have more people, we have more people here know how to do, you know, quantitative studies. Okay. Uh, okay, good to know the distribution here. Oh, sorry. I, apparently, I'm always giving you the... <laughs> Okay, good to know. Okay, so um, so this will be the actually this will be the last uh, you know last slide to know a little bit more about your background. So um, uh, in doing so, I could actually adjust my um, you know uh, workshop a little bit to tailor you know to um to actually 
to tailor made the content to your needs. So thank you very much for telling me, you know, what you want, what you want to learn and uh, where you are at uh, when it comes to research. So, okay, let's come back to the, let's come back to the uh, workshop. All right, we share, thank you. So, so I feel like I'm kind of uh, uh, going back to the COVID uh, teaching mode during the COVID time. I remember during the COVID, I was uh, assistant professor at Polytech University, you know, applied social sciences. During those two years, we did a lot of teaching online. So, um, you know, tonight actually reminded me of that. So then, um, so the first, actually the first thing before I start, I wanted to mention to you is, you know, the difference between ESG reporting and impact assessment. So, um, cause in the past few years, I've been involved, I've been in involved in many, um, you know, import, uh, impact assessment and impact measurement uh, projects. And uh, oftentimes people, you know, people ask me this question, you know, how does, how is that related to ESG reporting? But, uh, or, even you know the most recent um uh the most recent um uh you know the SDG standards impact standards so a lot of times this type of ESG reporting um will it's more about reporting the input you know reporting the input reporting the activity and reporting the output so input of course related to kind of the kind of resources that you put in you know in order to generate certain impact that could be manpower that could be you know uh, funding and activity for example yes what um you know yes relating to ESG reporting would be you know the kind of practices or the organizational policies that you put in place you know in order to um, ensure certain you know, to ensure certain uh, social responsibilities or environmental responsibilities. However, you know, this kind of ESG reporting is very different from impact assessment. So impact assessment is really about, you know, trying to make, uh, trying to articulate, you know, the outcomes and trying to measure the change. So that's the key difference between ESG reporting standards and the impact assessment. So I understand um, some of you tonight may be uh, expecting to uh, hear some of the you know tips when it comes to ESG reporting. So I'm afraid tonight's workshop is more about you know impact assessment. But you can always uh, you can always approach me, and I am happy to explain you know the differences between this um, ESG reporting and impact assessment. So tonight we will mainly talk about you know the kind of uh, uh, the framework the approach we use you know to articulate to articulate the impact and how we can actually assess the impact so um I'm sure I think everybody here tonight you know are quite familiar with logic model so I'm not going to uh, go into details about logic model anymore and uh, so we instead we'll talk about these five parts see uh, these five uh, uh, parts. So um, at first, I want to introduce the theory of change approach. And of course, I think some of us have also heard of uh, theory of change numerous times. And um, but I guess, you know, um, we hear different versions of a theory of change. So tonight, I'd like to take this opportunity to kind of uh, to align everyone's understanding about theory of change. And then we will talk about, you know, the program developments, uh, the kind of different uh, modes of assessment that uh, that are suitable for different program development stages. So we would have, you know, the pilot stage, then we can have the, you know, more uh, prototyping stage, and then also the mature stage. So different stage of program development would entail you know what need to what need to have different type of uh, different mode of assessment. So we will also talk about that, and then the third part. So we will talk about theory building and outcome mapping. So in theory building and outcome mapping, we will introduce some serious, um, you know, qualitative research methods to teach you how to actually build theory of change and how to actually identify and map out the outcomes. And this is. Um, Actually, for this part, um, uh, I was also struggling because, you know, um, 
uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, me and my team, we have been developing this kind of uh, technology for the past few years, you know, trying to like um, um, develop the method to actually to, to uh, map out how to actually build theory of change and how to map outcomes. So tonight is a chance for us to share our share um, our insights with you guys. And then the fourth part is outcome measurement and psychometrics. You know, so psychometrics, of course, is another um, uh, kind of area of knowledge that I think is quite key when it comes to skill selection. So I won't go into details, um, you know, about psychometrics because that would take a psychologist, you know, one semester to learn, to properly, to properly learn psychometrics. But I think tonight I will introduce some, you know, basic concepts that, um, that are quite relevant. Uh, when it comes to skill selection, you know, uh, you know, skill selection for outcome measurement. So uh, last but not least, so we will talk about impact tracking and then research designs that could be used for impact tracking. Okay, so, so for the first uh, uh, section, the theory of change approach, you know, um, I wonder how many of us, you know, um, actually read about the history of the theory of change. So theory of change was uh, developed by Carol, uh, Carol Weiss. So Carol Weiss is a professor um, of education at Harvard Graduate School of Education. So her research really focused on policy studies, particularly in education. And she was also one of the earliest scholars to develop scientific methods for uh, evaluating social programs. So she passed away about 10 years ago. And Weiss was also one of the founders of the theory of change. So it's a methodology for organizations to effect social change. And um, so she actually, uh, so she defines a theory of change quite simply and elegantly as a theory of how and why an initiative works. Actually, I've told uh, I've told many um, you know uh, uh, in in many workshops already when people ask me, so what is theory of change? So I simply just say, okay, so um, you you need to have assumptions about what works and what don't work. So um, that's basically that. But then um, to to then to to be able to scientifically you know uh, evaluate or to scientifically um, uh, kind of articulate the theory of change and evaluate the impact or map the outcome. So we need to be able to ask ourselves what is the treatment, what is the intervention, right? So sometimes we have organizations come to us saying like, hey, you know, Nora, could you please help us, you know, evaluate the impact of uh, impact of our program in this. Uh, six schools. So then uh, I of, oftentimes I ask them, you know, what, uh, so uh, what have you done? You know, what have you done in these schools? Then they say, okay, we've done certain installations of this and that. So we provide certain data. So like, for example, panels to show certain uh, data. And, um, but then the, the next question for me is, you know, so yeah, you can put a panel there and then to show data to the uh, to the teachers and the students, but without certain, you know, intervention without, of course, installation itself is already a treatment, is an intervention, but without strong dosage, you know, dosage of like further intervention, like bring the students' attention or teachers' attention to the data, then oftentimes there, there wouldn't be any you know, wouldn't be any like impact. So we often need to ask ourselves, what is really our treatment? What is our intervention? So we need to think about what is the theory behind our intervention? What is the theory behind our treatment, right? And then what are its intended and measurable outcomes? So, um, and then how are the data to be collected and analyzed such that the causal links between treatments and outcomes can be described in most compelling ways, right? So um, in a way, so I understand when we develop a program, you know, oftentimes our surface, our social programs have many activities and have many components. And sometimes those activities, we just replicate, you know, the kind of activities that we see from other from other NGOs or from other corporate teams, because we see, hey, you know, those activities, they look cool, right? They look very exciting. And then we can, 
it and those activities seem to be very um seem to be very useful so we just copy those activities and then we assemble those activities under a certain kind of uh, framework but then we need to think about why why are we assembling you know those activities together are there any like coherent assumptions behind this assemblage of activities right so we need to be think about that we need to be asking ourselves those kind of questions and then what are the outcomes actually coming out of those activities so that's why it is for impact measurement or for impact management it is critically important to actually to adopt theory of change approach so the first step is to surfacing and articulating a theory of change and how to do that, we will uh, very quickly come to that. And then the second step is to measure a program's activity and in, you know, to map out a program's activities and intended outcomes. And the third step is to analyze and interpret, you know, the results and the results of an, uh, you know, uh, evaluation, including implications for adjusting, you know, initial, uh, initi sorry, initi uh, initiatives theory of change and its allocation of uh, uh, resources. So initiative here all could also be program, could also be any type of uh, projects, right? So, um, so with kind of, uh, with the articulation of the theory of change, and with the articulation of the impact of uh, different program activities that of course would have implications for the allocation of resources, right? So I remember this is something that uh, our participants are also interested in. Okay, <clears throat> that's, um, so, oh, okay, sorry. Need to first go with this. So this is actually, uh, uh, this is a very interesting, um, can you see uh, the slide? On the slide, actually, there are like a very complicated diagram. So the diagram basically shows a pathway from intervention to the long-term outcome, right? So um, uh, you have intervention and you have precondition and you have indicators for the for the precondition and you have out long-term outcome. And uh, a lot of people also prefer to use, you know, milestones instead of precondition. So precondition basically means that what kind of conditions do we need to uh, achieve in order to reach the long-term outcome? So a lot of people use intervention and then we have short-term uh, you know, short-term milestone, mid-term milestone, and a long-term milestone and long-term outcome. And then um, also we have people use different terms as well. You have from intervention to short-term outcome to mid-term outcome and a long-term outcome. So it is, uh, it's totally fine to use those, um, you know, words interchangeably, but because they, you know, they mean quite similar things. But the, my point here is, um, to you is to actually think about how we can actually map out, you know, the in different intervention, different program activities, and then how we uh, map out their linkages to short-term outcomes, mid-term outcomes, and the long-term outcomes. So this is basically how we apply, you know, theory of change. And then, um, and also to articulate, you know, the assumptions behind why this kind of intervention would lead to this outcome and then to the long-term outcome as well. So the indicators here often, uh, you know, uh, I see a lot of people tend to use what uh, what, what are the indicators for uh, milestones? When you achieve certain milestones, what are the indicators for those milestones? So then if you achieve certain short-term outcomes, what are the certain indicators for that? So that's basically we need to... Um, um, you know, in order to articulate the theory of change, we need to be thinking about these different um, uh, different facets. Okay, so when it comes to articulating the, uh, the articulating the assumptions behind, you know, behind the program uh, behind the program activities or behind the design of program activities, so I like to introduce um, some research concepts here. So. Um, um, so are we all looking at this uh, independent uh, dependent variable slide? 
Okay, great. So um, independent variable basically means, you know, uh, that our interventions often mean our intervention, intervention or our, uh, you know, program activities. And then the outcome would be, uh, outcome one could be a mediator, you know, for example, the increased knowledge or increased awareness of our participants. And then outcome two could be our, you know, the attitude, attitudinal change of our participants, right? That could be also the dependent variable. And then, so what are the moderate moderating variables? So the moderating variables basically weaken or enhance the relationship between the, you know, independent variables and dependent variables. So for example, so the examples of uh, moderating var uh, variables could be gender, education level, or socioeconomic status. So for example, um, you know, um, we often say like, um, uh, if our intervention, so if our intervention is, um, is about job training or, uh, and then our outcome is, you know, the income level. So then the people who have higher education level, you know, would benefit more from this kind of intervention. So uh, education level actually would, um, you know, enhance the relationship between job training and then the outcome basically is the income. And then also the social economic status is also, uh, is also um, a often used you know, moderating variable. So usually the lower social status, uh, lower social economic status would be inversely, you know, uh, affecting the relationship between whatever social interventions we have and then to the outcome, you know, to the dependent variable. And then how about the control variable? So control variables are basically contextual factors. So, um, so when we're trying to um, understand the theory of change, you know, in say in Sansui Po, and then each district or each community may have its very unique theory of change, right? Because of its um, community assets, because of other, you know, um, other contextual factors. So, so when we uh, discover, when we articulate, when we can articulate a theory of change, one in one community does does not mean that we, um, you know, we can apply the theory of change to a different community exactly because of those contextual factors, right? Um, okay, so while we, uh, so when we can articulate, you know, this, um, re these relationships between independent variable to dependent variable to mediating variable and then moderating variable. So basically through doing that, we can articulate the assumptions um, on how interventions or how our, you know, program activities are leading to the outcomes, right? So any questions so far? Sorry. Um, the reason why I'm asking is oftentimes this part, you know, the because um, it's evening and this is a research methodology class. So, and I know it's quite demanding. So let me know if you have any questions, okay? So I can go back a little bit. So this is a very basic research design. So if you talk to any of the researchers, they often ask you, so tell me, so please tell me, what is your independent variable? What is your dependent variable? You talk to any professors in university, the first question they ask you is, okay, so what are your independent variable? What are your dependent variable? So yeah, the independent variables basically are your program activities, right? Your interventions, the X, right? So the dependent variable are basically the outcomes, right? The outcomes you want to achieve. So in order to like articulate assumptions, we need to identify, you know, amongst all this, uh, you know, program activities and outcomes, we need to be able to theorize. So what are the in independent variables that we are investigating and what are the dependent variables are investigating, we are looking at, right? And then what are the variables actually moderating these kind of relationships? Okay, so, <clears throat> so and then uh, oftentimes we use jockey club's back model. So back model, um, actually, uh, they talk about the knowledge, they talk about attitude, they, call, they talk about behavior, the condition. So I'd like to ask you, you know, um, for the back model here, so which one would be the independent variable? Which one would be 
the you know could be the um you know the outcome dependent variable you can type the answer in the in the chat room so back model is very very widely used in hong kong so what is the independent variable here and then what is the what could be the what mediating variable what could be the dependent variable So knowledge, okay, uh, knowledge is often considered, you know, the first step, the first outcome, right? So we often need to have, we often need to increase our participants or beneficiaries' awareness, skills, and capacities before they can change their attitude, right? Before they can change their motivation, right? Exactly. Uh, then while they, when they, when they're equipped with knowledge, skills and when they change after they change their attitude so they may change their behavior so when their behavior the behavioral changes may lead to the change in their conditions so the conditions could be you know quality of life living conditions or their conditions with their relate you know like uh the relationship quality quality of their relationships right so these are all the conditions so if you apply if you kind of re re uh, refigure you know uh jockey club's back model into this. So you can see we have the interventions. So the interventions, we want to change their knowledge and we also want to change their attitude and the behaviors, right? So through drawing, uh, through drawing these kind of diagrams, we can actually articulate what are our theory of change and what are the variables actually moderating and mediating the kind of relationships between those factors, okay? And then, of course, um, here I like to talk about uh, talk about another uh, another um, variable, which is confounder. So, um, confounder confounding variables often um, discussed. And one of the question is I like to ask you is why do women often have you know why do uh, sorry why do women often live longer than men? Do you know the answer? So in this in this question, genes. <laughs> so yeah, good. Poor women. <laughs> we don't handle stress well, but then we're supposed to live longer than men, right? So women often have much longer life expectancy than men. So a lot of uh, exposure here being basically meaning exposure to intervention, right? A lot of people say, okay, it's genetic. A lot of people say, oh, because we take it, take, uh, you know, um, biological reasons. But um, oftentimes, you know, the confounding variable is, you know, um, you know, men tend to uh, seek risky behaviors. That's why they are more likely to involved in all kinds of accidents. So that's why it's not because. Uh, women's genes lead to women's long life expectancy. That's because some other like confounding, uh, confounding reasons that lead to you know the as, uh, you know women uh female as a gender you know would lead to longer life expectancy. So this is another kind of a confounding variable that we need to uh, we need to um be aware you know when. Uh, interpreting, you know, the kind of uh, uh, causal relationships um, between our program activities and the outcome, right? So sometimes we often assume that our program activities would cause certain outcomes, will lead to certain outcomes, but then oftentimes it could be, it could be, <clears throat> you know, it's the, some kind of uh, confounding variables that are leading to, you know, the the uh, the betterment of the outcome rather than it's your um, program activities, right? So why should we use a theory of change approach? Because theory of change approach sharpen, you know, sharpens the planning and implementation of an initiative. And with a uh, theory of change in hand, the measurement and data collection elements of the evaluation process will also be facilitated. And also articulating a theory of change at the outset, you know, outset can bring together stakeholders on the same 
on the same page as to what inputs, activities, and contextual conditions are needed to bring about short-term, mid-term, and long-term outcomes, right? Because I think, um, I understand that oftentimes we need to, we also discuss with our founders, you know, what inputs, what activities we, we need, and what kind of uh, contextual conditions we need. But if we can articulate better, you know, the theory of change, and then so it's easier to um, to describe, you know, how our program activities, you know, what kind of um, factors or designs, program designs are leading to the outcomes, right? And then the next part is I like to uh, show you is the theory of change for outcomes at different levels. So oftentimes we uh, care about, you know, um, most of times our work, especially for uh, um, um, service delivery NGOs. I, I understand a lot of NGOs also doing a lot of community development work, but oftentimes our, um, you know, uh, social programs are targeting the individuals. So at the individual level, so we have certain outcomes that we often measure. So for example, the health and well-being outcomes, knowledge and skills, and their in income. But then, what it, what about the theory of change? You know, targeting at community or place level. Place meaning place based level. So then we probably will need to be looking at different set of outcomes. So for example, the community social ecological resilience. Right, social capital, you know, um, in terms of interconnectedness within the community, trust, inclusivity, or, you know, social cohesion, co uh, cooperation, and mutual help. So these are the community level outcome. So then in order to achieve those community level outcome, so what kind of theory of change, you know, would bring, you know, bring us to those outcomes, right? So um, I understand that, um, a jockey club spec model is so widely used. So sometimes we we don't we can't really jump out of the framework, right? So we apply back framework to all kinds of interventions. But actually, back model is me, um, you know, mostly used for individual level interventions, individual level interventions. So so for community and the place level place-based level interventions, we have different types of theory of change, and we also need to be looking at different uh, outcomes at different levels. So I hope you, you, I hope, uh, you know what I mean. So then if we're talking about change management at organizational level, so then we are looking at completely different set of outcomes again. So if we are trying to say, um, help NGOs to, you know, to enhance NGO performance or to help corporate to become more socially responsible and how um, to, you know, to build the capacity of social enterprises. So then we probably be looking at, you know, learning and innovation, productivity or ESC performance. So then we will also have a completely different set of theory of change to, you know, uh, to, to lead to those outcomes. And how about at the institutional level? So institutional level will be like a policy level, regulatory framework, right? So then we need to be looking at how the whether or not the institutions have these kind of adapt adaptability, or whether or not the institutional framework have um, enough legitimacy and accountability towards citizens, or you know could lead to equity in the distribution outcomes. Then how about the ecosystem change in the at industry level? So I understand many of us, especially like intermediaries, for example, Social Enterprise Summit and also mm, Social Ventures Hong Kong, a lot of intermediaries are trying to bring about ecosystem level change. Then what could be the theory of change for them, right? What could be the theory of change for them? And what could be the outcomes that they are, you know, trying to, trying to achieve? So then we need to be very careful, you know, um, what kind of level of outcomes we are looking at, and then what kind of uh, theory of change, what level of theory of change we, are, we will be pursuing, okay? So, so we can come back to that if you have questions. So this is again, you know, the illustration of uh, theory of change uh, at an individual level. And uh, so I kind of uh, modified the framework a little bit because um, for any, for in, uh, 
for any uh, you know intervention at the individual level. So ultimately, we want to see the changes in conditions. Then we want to work on their internal internal factors, and we want to improve their external factors. So we have program activities targeting their internal uh, at the in internal factors, and then we have interventions targeting at their you know external or environmental factors. So the internal factors could be cognitive, right? So knowledge awareness skill could be effective, you know, such as attitude, interest, preferences, values. It could be also behavioral, for example, uh, you know, um, uh, attempts or um, different kind of, uh, uh, you know, in behavioral intentions. So the so for external factors, that could be family, so, uh, family slash social support or inclusive community or job opportunities, institutional support, or even a built environment, uh, particularly for people with disabilities, such as barrier-free um, you know, environment or access to nature. So then we would lead to different, uh, you know, we will lead to the changes in the uh, conditions at, again, at individual level. So if you are looking at this kind of diagram, you could, so now we could immediately say, okay, so the orange square basically is the independent variable. The blue square basically is a bunch of dependent variables, right? So the green square basically includes a lot of uh, uh, a list of moderating variables. So then for interventions, so how can we use interventions, you know, to, um, <clears throat> you know, to enhance the internal factors and then to also to, um, to kind of enhance the external factors. And this is another example of a theory of change for community resilience. So uh, I won't go into details um, because this is um, the work of Elena Ostrom who won Nobel Prize for, uh, for her work on uh, you know, community resilience. So she looked at how communities come, how community members come together and then uh, to manage you know, shared resources. Because um, um, based on her research, you know, we, um, there are so many, you know, overuse of resource, uh, shared resources that lead to, you know, um, for example, climate crisis and all these urban challenges and also natural resource crisis. So in order to fix that, so uh, she look at how community members come together and then to build up this kind of governance system you know, to work together and then to manage resources, right? So this kind of a framework can be used at very grand level, you know, uh, macro level, or could also be used at meso or micro level, like micro neighborhood, uh, neighborhood level. And um, so I'm showing you um, another kind of, uh, um, you know, um, published results in uh, um, discussed a lot by, um, by community level um, uh, theory of change. So this is a kind of um, a community, uh, it's more like, it's more about place-based uh, theory of change regarding, uh, regarding, you know, land issues. So then you have a group of, uh, then you have a group of, uh, you know, um, community members, they come together so they can uh, identify all the land use issues. Then they can rank the issues based on the priority, based on the community needs. And then they can de uh, determine the drivers, you know, drivers of land use change and the environmental and social impacts. And with that, they can, you know, uh, uh, determine the desired, you know, future state. And they, then they can, you know, move on to goal setting and pathway building. So pathway building, so pathway building, then they can articulate their theory of change, right? So then this is, again, it's a kind of community level theory of change, um, uh, work rather than individual level work. Okay. So by showing you these examples, I hope, you know, um, I hope uh, that we are quite clear now um, that, you know, when we, when we uh, design our impact assessment plan or, um, yeah, when we plan our impact assessment um, research, we knew we need to be quite clear about um, you know, what level are we talking about? Are we talking about, you know, are we talking about, um, um, you know, intervention at the individual level or outcomes at the individual level? Or are we talking about intervention or outcomes at community place-based level or organizational level? Are we trying to bring 
bring about organizational level change or are we trying to bring about institutional change, for example, policy change? Or are we going to initiate ecosystem change? So for different types of changes at different levels, we need to have very different imagination of theory of change. We need to have very different imagination of antecedents, like variables, uh, independent variables that lead to those you know, ecosystem change, lead to institutional change, lead to organizational change. Right. So I would like to, I really would like to, you know, broad, you know, kind of uh, broaden our kind of uh, thinking a little bit here. Okay. So the next, uh, so the next uh, section I want to talk about is, um, so now that we are, uh, I hope, oh, so, okay, before I move on to the second uh, section, so I'd like to know any questions regarding theory of change. So in summary, yeah, so I'm, I'm just doing a little summary here so you can think about your question. So in summary, theory of change basically is your assumptions, right? Basically are your theoretical assumptions about what works and what doesn't work. So what you need to do is just to map out, to map out this map, you know, to map out these kind of pathways, how my interventions are leading to short-term, mid-term, and long-term outcomes, right? And then the assumptions behind that. So that's the theory of change, right? That's theory of change. That's the impact pathways that we want to articulate. Because without articulating our theory of change, it's very difficult for people to come in to do the impact assessment because then we will be so which stage are you at? Are you at the short term outcome or are we going to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, like a evaluation for your short term outcome or mid term outcome or long term outcome? Because if it's a short term outcome, so probably we can only evaluate, we can only measure certain outcomes and then probably the whole assessment will be finished within half year. But if it's a long term outcome, we probably need to do a five year, you know, uh, follow up studies. Right. So so that really could affect, you know, how we design, how we design the impact research. Right. So we need to be quite clear about, you know, the kind of theory of change. But also, I want to mention that it's totally OK if you um, if you have like, say, a theory of change 1.0, theory of change 2.0, meeting 18 factors. So that's very good. Fa that's very good question. So mediating factors are, um, you, can, you can treat it as a short-term outcome. So, um, so the short-term outcome will lead to the mid-term outcome. You, you understand what I mean here? So here, so I put it, put it here. So outcome one will be knowledge change, right? Outcome two will be attitudinal change. Imagine yourself running a workshop, like uh, say a five session workshop, right? So, and um, so the so the short term the short term outcome or the immediate change would be the increase of knowledge and the increase of skill, right? But would that actually make you? Uh, would that actually um, lead to attitudinal change? Probably not. Probably not, right? In order to have attitudinal change, we need to increase the dosage of intervention. When I say dosage, meaning you probably need to increase the number of sessions, or you probably need to um, like uh, add a little bit more, say uh, other type of uh, components, say the community component. You probably need to organize the like a circles, right? So then you have peers reinforce, you know, reinforce each other the knowledge and skills. Then you can probably bring about attitude, attitudinal change. So. To a certain extent, we can see knowledge, you know, knowledge change or skill change would be the short-term change, short-term outcome, uh, yeah, short-term outcome change, and then attitudinal change would be, you know, the mid-term change, and then behavioral change would be the long-term change. So knowledge change would be the mediator, right? So without awareness change, without um, knowledge change, then you wouldn't have any attitudinal change. Okay, so. So, um, so this is, for example, this diagram is often, um, I, I think, uh, mainly, I think, uh, very rigorous, uh, you know, um, scholars, they, they like to draw like this very um, rigid diagram, 
and the very artistic scholars, they like to, you know, make their diagrams a little bit more like uh, this way. But then actually the, 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 the thinking is the same, you know, the thinking behind it is the same, right? So we need to have intervention and then we have lead to, you know, short term and then mid term and then long term. So short term outcomes can always be, uh, can be regarded as uh, uh, mediating variables. Thank you. Okay, so now hopefully when you go read, uh, I know like some of you like to read research papers. So then, um, so then you'd be able to understand, you know, like uh, what those ver uh, what those terms mean. Okay, so the program stage and assessment mode. So now I like to bring in, a, 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 you know, bring your attention, draw your attention to this kind of uh, uh, program development stage. So oftentimes I get um, um, I get requests from um, you know organizations asking me to hey you know Nara could you please do a RCT for uh, could you please do a rigorous you know um, pre and uh, pre and post impact assessment or impact evaluation for my program I don't blame them because that's this is kind of the the discourse this is the kind of narrative you know um, out in the sector. But I like to actually show, but, you know, um, I like to also remind us that oftentimes, you know, when we design a program, it's uh, at it's at the pilot stage, right? So a lot of social workers know about that because when social workers develop a program, they always like to say, hey, we got to pilot this. It's a trial program. So before we actually make it formal, so we need to do several rounds of piloting. So um, using design language, we of course, we would use a prototype. So we would say we have several prototypes of those programs. So before we actually, um, before we actually, you know, um, um, consolidate the final theory of change, I don't, re I don't really recommend us, uh, you know, jump into the really the formal kind of quantitative impact assessment, because that would be a waste of your money. And um, so, okay. So let's um, go into details a little bit. So there are two modes of assessment. So one is formative, one the other one is summative. So the goal of formative assessment is to provide you know ongoing feedback that can be used to inform prototyping and in so as you know uh, with a view to um, enhancing your intervention. So it's much more learning oriented. So it's often used for pilot programs or programs at trial period or prototypes. Summative uh, assessment is to evaluate, you know, the impact of an established program. So what do I mean by established program? I mean that when you are very clear about the theory of change, you know, you have already gone through all the prototyping stage, and then you have already gone through the, the process of from evolving from theory of change zero, uh, 1.0 to theory of change 4.0, then you can say, hey, you know, uh, we've got a theory of change 4.0 now, so maybe we can uh, think about to conduct a summative, pro a summative impact assessment to actually you know, um, launch a large scale quantitative, um, you know, our randomized control trial, then I say, okay, no problem. So, so again, you know, here, um, before, uh, in, in, in other words, so before one has a very clear understanding of what works and what doesn't work based uh, TOC, impact measurement, you know, often takes the form of formative assessment and serves to inform the development of, uh, 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 theory of change, and it's not necessarily quantitative, and oftentimes it employs qualitative methods, such as collecting change stories from users to inform the development of TOC. So I understand that in the in a sector right now, there are many organizations advocating for collecting change of stories, and and uh, <clears throat> I'm also a big a supporter of that. I think it's great because by collecting only by um, collecting change stories, then we we will be able to understand what works and what doesn't work. You know, through those change stories, then we can see, hey, you know, what program activities are you know leading a uh, uh, leading to what kind of uh, outcomes are making what type of impact, right? So change stories are very very useful. 
and we uh, later we will talk about how to use change stories in um, in our impact measurement. So then, so for early stage kind of prototyping, I really recommend us to just to focus on impact stories and change stories, right? So through change stories, then we will be able to you know articulate our theory of change, and then to establish you know the linkages, the causal linkages between uh, program activities and outcomes. Right, so this is very important for the for the pilot programs, and then <clears throat> and then uh, as a program uh, you know improves or matures, then we can consider to use to add quasi experimental designs. So quasi experimental designs are not exactly you know random randomized control trial. So quasi experimental designs you can you know um, have a pre and post have a pre, uh, pre and post design, and then just to add a control group. They are not exactly randomized, but you we can start to consider that. And then of course, when your program is very much, when you are very clear about your theory of change, then we can consider to use randomized control trial. Because um, if you have any, if you have a little bit, if you have already engaged in impact measurement, then I think you'd understand what I mean by how difficult it is to conduct randomized control trial in field. It is easy to conduct RCT in schools, in universities, in the laboratory, you know, um, environment. But in actual field, it is very difficult because it's if it is it would be very hard for you to put two schools in the experimental arm to receive like very uh, innovative pedagogy, you know, intervention. And then find exactly the same two schools in a, a to use them as a control group, right? So it is quite um it it will be very challenging. Okay, so um now I would like to talk about the third part, which is theory building and uh, outcome mapping. So any questions regarding the relationship between program development stage and assessment mode? Okay, good. So now I'm going to talk about what kind of method can we use to build the theory and also to map the outcomes. So please bear with me. Now I'm going to introduce another research method. And uh, so if you are nerdy enough, then you'll be very, very interested in this part. So this is actually Coping and Strauss, you know. So some of you probably have heard about them uh, numerous, numerous times when you were students. Oh, I assume like tonight, probably there are some students here. So that's basically grounded theory. So I find in my in my um, impact assessment, uh, you know, work, I find grounded theory extremely useful, extremely useful, because grounded theory is developed to build theories, right? So when um, so I thought like, hey, why why can't why not you know using grounded theory methods in you know, in developing theory of change. So then I started okay, using I started thinking of her, yeah. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> is very unfun. Okay. Okay, good. So um so grounded theory, um so grounded theory methods, um basic thought, uh, you know, um can be used when you have when after you interviewed after you interview a lot of, after you collect a lot of change stories. So um, how many, if I, I, um, I just want to do, how many of you have, um, you know, used change story as a method to do the evaluation? Just, uh, you can, no, I, I can see some facial expressions here. Okay, so will you, um, appreciate more explanations. Okay, good. So change stories, um, change stories uh, um, is a phrase that often used by practitioners. So then um, for, uh, I think for social, so for social scientists, we often use critical incident technique. So um, I will type it in the chat. So you can also everyone in the meeting, critical, Incident. Sorry, typo here. Critical incident technique. So, um, so what we ask 
um, what we ask um, um, our participants are the these kind of questions. So, for example, um, you know, we ask them. So, um, uh, are there any like have uh, are there any memorable moments? You know, um, uh, when you you know after uh, when you participate the program. Or so they then they then the participants or users would recall a lot of uh, you know memorable moments or significant the moments that, that that are significant to them, right? So then how then you may ask me so how can we define you know um, critical right? So an event is critical when it leads to a change that can be recalled by interviewees. So it's actually quite um, the definition we use is very um, you know uh, straightforward. So when the when the interviewees can recall, hey, you know, I remember back then when I joined that when I joined that outdoor adventure, you know, uh, in camp, um, you know, there was one time, you know, um, this and that happened. I was so excited. It was so it was so much fun. And then when the interviewee was recalling, you know, was recalling that incident or event, then usually our interviewer would ask, so how did you feel back then? You know, tell me more about the incident. Tell me more about the event. You know, who whom else were in that event? You know, what happened? What kind of program activity were uh you know, um were you were you doing? You know, at that moment, and then what kind of change did you experience? You know, um, did you learn something out of this uh, event, or did you feel like anything um changed? You know, in you. So then we will use a kind of uh, interview. Uh, we will set certain interview questions, you know, trying to elicit, you know, uh, the linkages between program activities then and the kind of outcomes, the changes that happen to our users. So um, hope, I hope I answered uh, the questions in the chat room. So that's change stories. I understand that in the, in the sector, you know, different NGOs and different um, intermediaries we have different understanding of change stories we use different definitions of change stories so um this is how um we you know uh frame uh change stories and this is how we use you know critical incident technique to actually solicit uh to actually um trying to capture you know the uh program the effective program design and then the kind of changes that happen to the users okay and then by using, by use, by identifying those critical events, so we oftentimes we can also identify unintended outcomes, right? Because a lot of times we would identify intended outcomes, but by looking at those critical events, we can also identify intended, unintended outcomes. So then the next question you ask me, okay, Nora, so now we have a, a collection of 100 events or 100 critical incidents and a lot of changes. So, um, and a lot of things, how can we code? How can we code those information, right? So the way we code information is that we use grounded theory. So it's it's quite, uh, actually it's quite straightforward as well. So you do the open coding and then open coding, usually you can see, okay, what kind of program activities? So some program activities, you already have some concept in mind, you know? So this program activity is about teamwork. Those program activities about something else. And then, <clears throat> so those are the changes that you identify, those, uh, identify from those events. So then uh, you can group those codes, you know, by, gen by generating those categories, right? So we call it Excel coding. And um, so then you can, after you identify those bigger categories, then you can think about, so what are the theoretical connections between those categories, right? What are the, what are the theoretical connections between those categories? So um, when we did the impact, when we did this impact research for Hong Kong Award for Young People, it was quite interesting. So they also have a lot of program activity, different kind of outdoor adventure, you know, uh, program activities. But then we are, what we are looking at is, so the middle school students, they, re, they record also a lot of program activities, like the activities that excite them. Then we were looking, what we were looking for is, we were looking for the common, uh, the common features across those activities. So what features of the, what features of those activities actually, 
you know, excite our use, right? So the features could be, you know, the, the kind of uh, group competition, the features could be this and that. So those features are being uh, extracted, you know, from the, uh, through the coding process. Okay, and then we can also through the coding, through the events, we could also see, hey, you know, those users are experiencing, you know, they're not just only experiencing positive thinking, their horizon got broadened because they, um, in the evening, some of the youth, you know, they reported, middle school students, they reported that because they, they have overnight camp, right? So then they, sometimes they, you know, uh, they have the opportunity to share the room with students from other grades and from other schools. So by talking to students from other grades and other schools, they say, hey, okay, you're playing that game. Okay, that's what you're gonna do in the future. So by talking to, you know, different, you know, uh, students of similar age from different schools, their horizons can be broadened as well. So that's some kind of uh, unintended outcome that we also discovered, you know, from, the collect uh, from the critical incidents that we collected, you know, um, we collected from the from our interviewees. So the sorry, there is a question. Uh, I am thinking something like unconscious bias. People may not be aware of it. Um, yes, Bosco, you are correct. Um, there will always be recalling bias. There will always be recalling bias. So we are trying to. So we try to overcome that by actually, um, you know, conducting kind of uh, um, critical incident interviews, you know, um, right after each intervention component, so if we can, if we can. So we don't, you know, um, we can, of course, also conduct those interviews monthly or quarterly, but if, we, if you conduct those interviews quarterly, of course, there will be some memory loss and some recalling bias, right? And then, but if you conduct those uh, interviews right after, say, one significant in intervention component, say, right after the internship program, then you find a certain students and then you, you conduct focus group interview. What you ask them is just very easy. So tell me what excited, uh, so what were, what were the exciting moments, you know? So then they would talk, they, they could just share their, they could, uh, you know, share those moments, share those memories. So by jotting down those memories, then you can ask further questions. So why, why were those moments significant to you? Tell me a bit more. So why were they significant? Then they could tell you a little bit more. So uh, what kind of changes that happened to them? Why those moments are significant? So by digging into those moments and then by doing some kind of systematic coding, so then we can find, you know, connections between, you know, program design and outcomes. There we have our theory of change, right? There we have our theory of change. And uh, <clears throat> here I want to mention process tracing a little bit um, because some of you uh, also gave me recommendations saying like, hey, you know, um, um, how, uh, so based on what, so what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of, um, reference framework can we use when we're trying to draw connections between these, um, you know, categories, between these variables, right? So, and then oftentimes I would use time as a, uh, as a frame of uh, reference. So I see, I will think about, okay, so what type, you know, what events happen first? You know, I will look at what program activities happen first and what program activity happen next. Because when you look at a program, you know, when NGOs develop, uh, delivering a program, they never deliver a, a, all these programs activity at the same time. Uh, rarely, yes, it happens, but oftentimes they, there is always a sequence, you know, they always do certain component first and then they move on to the next component. So then each component will entail a lot of significant moments, right? So we're trying to map those events based on the time based on the time. So we call it process tracing, process tracing. So um, if you want to read more about theory building process tracing, you can also, here is a very good, uh, a very good uh, uh, reference uh, re <clears throat> written by Beach and Patterson. So these two scholars, uh, uh, they are process tracing, uh, very classical, um, very good, uh, very, they're, uh, I say very foundational. Okay. 
So then the here, um, okay, so I only have 15 minutes left, so I probably should move on a little bit. So here uh, on the diagram, you could see also a little bit more, you know, how, how the pro process tracing, how the time dimension can be applied to, uh, you know, theory building. So for, a, for example, at a theoretical level, so we have X. So on the left side of the left side of the slide, right? So we have X here. Oh. Can you see the laser point? Okay, that's good. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just enjoying this new tech, enjoying some of the technology here. So, <clears throat> so X here. So X basically is the intervention, right? Outcome is the, but then how, how, how do our interventions actually lead to outcome? So this is the this is the uh, black box, right? So at the empirical level, what we can collect is all the different events, the critical events that we can or change stories that we could collect from our you know interviewees or participants, and then we can map those events based on you know the time, right? What event happened first? What event happened next? So, and then we move on to the right-hand side of the uh, slide. Then we can start to analyze. Okay, so CM on top of uh, the, uh, the diagram meaning causal mechanism. So, right, causal mechanism. So how X lead to the first, you know, short-term outcome, and then how short-term outcome lead to the mid-term outcome, and then lead to the long-term outcome. Right, and then so what are the observable manifestations? So again, the observable manifestations are those critical incidents that recalled by our participants, right? So those participants say, hey, you know, like what happened and what happened? So um, so um, based on our experience, this is a great way to actually map out, to develop, you know, uh, the theory of change, to map out the impact pathways, um, how, and then to to establish the causal to establish the causal causal linkages between the inter, uh, program interventions and outcomes, and then when I say interventions, I don't mean activities. I mean designs. Okay, because when it comes to activities, there could be so many different types of activities. We want to find the common features across activities. So, for example, I know a lot of NGOs in Hong Kong are using outdoor adventure as a mode of intervention. And then all those activities are based on adventure-based counseling uh, uh, theory. So, right, so then, so we, we, we don't really want to limit, you know, the innovation of social workers to come up with all kinds of activities, right? But then we want to find what are the common, you know, what are the common uh, design principles across those effective effective um you know across those activities so what makes those what make those activity work right that's what we want to find out so what make those activities work be you know how that how those activities are designed you know for example for hong kong award for young people they were like saying okay um like uh um so they often create a competition between groups and then so that's actually a great design to to um to nudge the students to focus on the group uh to focus on the shared uh group objective right and then that actually force you know um kind of foster uh like a teamwork and then they also have different kinds of, for example they they also wouldn't give them all the resources they need so this kind of design would also inst stimulate the kind of creativity so we need to we need to look at what are the kind of the features or the, the the features across activities that make those activities work and make those activities um you know effect change okay and then again um okay so let me go to the next slide so any questions before i move on to the next part Okay, so um, to su to summarize, uh, to sum up, so in this part, so we talked about how we can use events, how you how we can use change stories, and and also how we can map out the change stories along the time dimension, and then how we can analyze those change stories, you know, with grounded theory, so then we can actually identify the effective 
you know, uh, effective design features across those program activities, and then uh, to understand the, you know, the theory of change, basically what make those activities work, and then what outcomes come out of those activities, right? Okay, let's move on to the fourth part. So fourth part is outcome measurement and psychometrics. So um, I understand that many of you may, uh, you know, kind of want me to say, okay, so Nara, please tell me what are the impact metrics uh, that are often used. Sorry, I, I, I won't be able to tell you because there are probably millions of impact metrics out there. So, um, but what I can tell you tonight is, you know, um, if you look at those in, uh, you know, international impact metrics frameworks, indeed, you know, all the frameworks are aligning to get aligning with the SDG goals. So uh, more and more impact metrics are being developed under each SDG goal. So for example, no poverty, no poverty is one goal, right? So to reach that goal, there are many, many impact metrics are being measured you know, for, for this particular goal. Okay, so, so if you want to like, um, if you want to um, have a quick access, you know, um, to, if you're kind of thinking, oh, you know, what metrics can I use then for each goal and each impact category? So what you can use is IRIS. So IRIS um, is not a new framework or it's not a new uh, system. So I think it came out it has been around for almost 10 years. So they have building their um, they have been building their impact metrics database for a long time. And then <clears throat> this IRIS system has also been aligning itself with SDG goals and all the other um, you know, major impact standards. So um, I'd really would like um, I I'd really recommend you guys to actually look at the impact metrics being used um, you know, uh, in this system. But of course, having said that, you know, it is only a database. It does not include, it may not include all the kind of metrics that you are looking for, but at least I think it's a good start. So some of the metrics may inspire you to think about the kind of uh, intended outcomes that you would like to, uh, that you would like to use. Okay, so that's Iris. And um uh, another thing I like to mention about Iris is, you know, um, a lot of impact investors, uh, global impact investors, um, they are all using this system. So if you are interested in, uh, say, um, getting funding from, uh, you know, international philanthropic foundations or impact investors, so I think uh, they will be looking at the same system. So again, um, then, okay, now let's take a look at uh, actual method how how we can actually measure the outcomes so for observable so there are two types of variables so we um we talk about the type of variables in terms of research design now we talk about variables in terms of statistics and measurement right so uh, the variables in terms of design we talk about independent variable dependent variable that's about research design and now we're talking about how we can actually measure them. So this is more related to statistics. So for the observable variables, so obviously it's, you can think about direct measurement, for example, uh, for income, that's dollar sign. And for other observable uh, va uh, variables, you can refer to the kind of metrics that recommended by IRIS you know, system. And for latent variables, that's something that I like to highlight a little bit because latent variables are uh, the kind of variables I feel like oftentimes um, people have problem have difficulty with. And so what are the latent variables? Latent variables are psychosocial and cognitive outcomes are often latent because they cannot be directly observed. They cannot be directly measured. And so that's latent. And examples could be self-esteem, resilience, identity, depression, intelligence, and, and the like. So we can only measure those latent variables indirectly. So there are certain uh, measurement principles for latent variables. So for example, we often translate an outcome, latent outcome into multiple items. So we could use multiple items of attitudinal, attitudinal statements um, to, measure, to measure attitudinal outcomes, right? Uh, we can also use multiple items of uh, behavioral indicators and 
and we can also use um, uh, use a multiple item behavioral indicator to measure, for example, resilience, right? And uh, or measure depression. And we can also use puzzles to measure intelligence. And um, so for psychosocial outcomes, um, the kind of response scale, response scale, I mean, like, how do you actually respond to those questions, right? So we often use like to skill. So the kind of skill that you often see is from strongly disagree to, to strongly agree, one to five, that's called like to skill, right? To measure the extent of agreement to attitudinal statements or the frequency of behaviors. So frequency behaviors could be, it never happened to all, oh, ha it happens, you know, always, right? So we often see this kind of like to scale. And for cognitive outcomes, of course, you know, um, we often use puzzles to measure the performance of cognitive functions. And because, you know, since it's, uh, since the measurement is very indirect, then we, um, we probably wonder, so how can we be sure that we are measuring what we want to measure, right? So the next question is, how, how, how can we know we're measuring what we want to measure? So there are two questions, uh, two concepts. One is reliability, one is validity. So I'm sure some of you have already uh, learned about these two concepts. So please bear with me. So for the first bull's eye, so it's very reliable, not valid because it's not really hitting the bull's eye, but every, every shooting hits basically, it's very reliable. It's a very reliable gun. And then the second boost eye is low validity and low reliability because it kind of goes everywhere. And then it's not really hitting the boost eye, right? And then the third one is not reliable and not valid, meaning like it's going everywhere and it's also not reliable. Um, so it's kind of third, the second and third are probably uh, quite similar. And then what we want is, what we want our measurement is the both reliable and the valid, okay? So how can we actually measure that? How can we measure the reliability and the validity? So some of you probably heard of internal consistency reliability. So why the internal consistency? Because what? Because here we say for latent variable, we often use, we often use um, multiple items. We often use multiple items. So then we want to measure the internal consistency among those multiple items, right? So, um, and then the indicator we often use is Kronbacher Alpha. And then what we look at is basically the correlation across those items. So if there are high correlation amongst the, all the items, meaning that there's high internal consistency, you know, um, between those items. So here is the, some figures that you can see. So usually be, uh, above 0.8 is quite considered quite satisfactory. So if you wanna, how can we calculate, then you can, you know, follow the step. Uh, to go use SPSS to calculate that. But when you actually choose scale, sometimes scales often tell you, you know, what's their Kronbacher alpha. So when it, what is uh, validity? So validity meaning that you are actually measuring what you want to measure, right? So firstly, what we can look at is face validity. So you can just look at, look at those items. Are uh, those items actually relevant and essential to the concept that you want to measure? So if the items, you know, read, when you read those items, those items don't seem even relevant, meaning that that skill probably just doesn't, isn't really relevant to what you want to measure. So content validity, meaning you need to think about uh, all important domains are covered. And then the contract validity. So um, some of you probably heard about EFA and CFA. So um, so you wonder about that. So I, I will just very quickly go through that. We don't have time tonight to go into details, but EFA is often used to reduce number of items and CFA is used to confirm factor structure. So just only for those who are interested, who are nerdy enough, who are interested in actually um, you know, looking at this, uh, the structure of the scales, right? So when they select scales. So this is basically um, the, uh, the scale structure. So for example, this is the, the factor structure of uh, emotional intelligence. So the emotional intelligence has 16 items, multiple items, 16 items. Because it's latent, we cannot directly measure them. We develop 16 items. 
So four dimensions. So first dimension is about awareness of your own emotion. And the second dimension is awareness of others' emotion. And then use emotion to motivate yourself and a emotional re regulation, right? So this is the kind of statistical model that we create to, to do the confirmatory analysis. Then we kind of run the model through the data. So that through the data meaning, so we probably would uh, sample we would have a 100 um, people filling the question, filling the skill of emotional intelligence. So we have 100, you know, 100 surveys. So with those 100 surveys, we can actually see if the data fit, you know, the factor structure that we have, uh, that we uh, create. So that's confirmatory analysis. So if the, if the, if the statistics show that there's a very goodness of fit, you know, the, the fitness is very high, that means that your skill has very strong validity, okay? Okay, uh, I see that I'm being reminded, so I will go very quickly, give me five minutes and I will finish. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I will go, I will skip discriminant and convergent because um, um, this is more related to, I think uh, if you are really into that, you can read about it, okay? So rule of thumb for skill selection. So always, um, always check components or inches of a skill. So for example, resilience. You know, there are so many skills measuring resilience. Do you know which resilience skill you're gonna choose, right? If you, just now, if you type resilience in your in Google search, you know, you will come to a site tell you there are eight best resilience skills. So even for the even among these eight resilient skills, you need to be able to choose like, so which resilient skill is best for your outcome, right? Because each resilient skill probably is measuring different dimensions. So you need to be, you need to look at those dimensions and then you need to think about whether or not those dimensions are capturing, you know, the outcomes, right? So you need to check the face validity and the content validity. And also another rule of thumb is never pull one or two items from each dimension. Always, if you want to pull, pull a whole dimension out. So usually one dimension is measuring, could be measuring one outcome. So for example, if you're interested in one outcome, which is awareness of others' emotion, you pull four items together. You don't pull one item out of awareness of other emotion, one item out of awareness of your own dimension. That's a big no-no. So if you wanna pull items, you pull the whole dimension out, okay? Okay, then I'll quickly talk about impact tracking. So this is this is a very, um, I think if you, for those who do, re, um, who are in charge of man who are in charge of building the database so you'd be very happy to kind of to look at this uh excel table so if this excel table it could be excel it could be sbss so any kind of uh, uh database so as you can see the first column is all the users right and then their age and gender and the group group meaning like if you have experimental design you need to you know indicate if they're experimental group or control group and then as we just mentioned, we need to map out all the program activities they participate. So how user A may participate in pro activity one or not activity two, but activity three. So when we do the kind of attendance check, so if you have like kind of online attendance registration, so you may be able to pull this data already. So you have a very good, um, you know, uh, kind of a tracking of who attended what activities, right? And then we also want to be able to track their outcomes, like outcome A and outcome B from T0 to T1. T0 meaning uh, pre-intervention baseline, pre-intervention uh, their level of outcome. So for example, what, uh, what are their, um, you know, in depression level before the, inter uh, before the intervention? That's the T0. And T1 would be what's, uh, what's their depression level after you know, after the intervention. And then sometimes we do a follow-up survey, meaning T2, follow-up survey could be conducted like say half year after the intervention or even one year after the intervention, then, um, then et cetera. Then we can have T0 baseline, T1 right after, and T2 half year 
you know, um, after and then T T three, you know, one year after. So we can keep building the database. So when the statistician receive this database, they'd be very very happy because you are already, you know, so it's already a ready to be analyzed database. Okay. So. Alrighty. So some. Uh, so one last thing. Sorry, just one last. Uh, I understand some of you are interested in SRI, so I just want to um, um, want to emphasize that um, actually SRI, you know, you can do SRI. SRI often is applied after we clarify our theory of change, after we consolidate our theory of change, then we can cons we can do SRI. We do not do SRI at the pilot stage, because at the pilot stage, we have a lot of program activities and we are not even clear how those activities are causing what changes and outcomes are not even clear. So if we apply SRI at that time, so we would lose a lot of information about how those activities are connected. You know what I mean? Because in a lot of times for a social program, different program components, they work as a whole. They work holistically. So if you're already applying SRI at the pilot stage and you say, hey, you know, this program activity is it, uh, seems to create bigger impact. So and then the other program activity is creating less impact. So let's kind of cut that program activity. That's a big no-no because a lot of times those program activities are working together holistically. You know, some program activities probably are working on, you know, family relationships. Some program activities are working on knowledge and skills. Those program activities are supposedly having, you know, work uh, hand in hand. But if you apply SRI at that stage, you say, hey, you know, it seems like um, doing the workshop doesn't really create a lot of impact. So let's, you know, Bye. let's take that uh, off. So then um, then you would lose a lot of um, insights, uh, insights on how the program activities are working together. So I really strongly recommend if you want to apply SRI, please do apply SRI after you are after you clarify, you know, your theory of change. OK. So thank you very much. Sorry, I uh, overrun eight minutes. <laughs> It's okay. <clears throat> so, okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Noah, for sharing tonight. I'm sure we all have uh, gained deeper knowledge in the, the, the best practice of current impact measurement and research. Coming up, we have uh, around 20 minutes for Q&A. To ask the question, please press the button of the two bar or raise your hand or taste your question in the chat box. Uh, yes, it's time for Q&A. Can, uh, you can now ask, see anyone want to ask some question? I see uh, Miranda okay. also Ma asked a question. Yeah, Miranda, about, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks, Nora, for your uh, presentation. It's not easy to summarize everything in one and a half hour. Thanks for the highlight. So, uh, I think my question is uh, simple. Uh, I guess most of us would have an understanding what a, a, a research should be, like all the hypotheses mm -hmm. and then testing. But probably, I guess the reason why we have such a huge audience tonight mm -hmm. is how we can actually apply the research or impact assessment in our funding proposal. And you mm -hmm. always understand that our funders expect um, uh, mm. you know, evidence, okay, tell us why we have to support you, show me in one year, two years, right, and all that. So uh, in a nutshell, we are not doing all these in the university setting, we're not going to do any thesis. Mm. So how can we apply what mm. you just share, uh, say the number of variables, probably we are doing everything at the same time, because we only have 12 months, okay, what's your mm. practical advice for us to apply it? That's my first question. And the second mm. question is, um, I think your last slide, your comment is very mm. important. And I very much hope that you would educate our fund or even the government <laughs> because 
now even uh, I, I'm sure there are some business people here. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so because now people know the word SROI, they ask us, "What's your SROI? Why I have to give you one million, ten million dollars?" Mm -hmm. But what you are telling us just now is, "Don't do this before you find out the change." Right? Again, it's all about having the short time, and we have to seek the funding. We have to show our impact and mm -hmm. all that. So, <laughs> yeah. So two questions. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, thank you very much for uh, for the patience tonight. And I understand it's evening and everybody already had a long day and still have to listen to all this dry research stuff. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate your your interest and, and your um, patience. And um, and uh, uh, to answer the first question, I think uh, what founder really. Yeah, I've been I've been had the opportunity the uh, kind of uh, opportunity to work with a few funders now um yeah some funders of course they are very uh, they do care about sri but i think when they mention sri it's more like at the portfolio level so um in a sense that um, um they also very much uh they i think they care a lot about evidence to start with you know they they want they want the um the service delivery or the program uh program managers to show evidence and to show evidence how their program activities are achieving you know outcomes and what outcomes are you know uh what outcomes are there and what changes are there so they want to know the very clear series of change they want to see clear they want to see clear evidence and then nowadays i think a more uh government also start to put a lot um also start to de develop their own outcome framework. For example, I think uh, there's a um, AS, if I if I remember correctly, there's a EPSO ESPO 3. It's by Education Bureau. Sorry, I, I'm, you know, I just learned about that framework. So that's the framework that developed by Education Bureau to look at different emotional learning kind of uh, outcome framework. So then, um, so funders would also want to see if all those uh, programs are, you know, are aligned with policy directions as well. And um, yeah, so I think um, be they the home, Home and Use Affair Bureau or funders there just want to see evidence first. So if you if you if we can show strong evidence and we if we can say like we we yeah. can uh, uh, articulate you know the series of change and. And um. And then so after we consolidate the series of change. Then we can see these are the these are the uh, program activities, these are the outcomes, and these are the kind of resource need by the program activity. Then we can actually calculate a a real SRI. In a sense, the real SRI is the SRI for you know approved theory of change. Then funder can use that figure to um, at their portfolio level. So you know what I mean. So rather than jump into SR assessment at the at the very beginning, uh, well before even, uh, before we're even clear about what's what you know what works and what doesn't work. So that's my um, that's my suggestion here. Okay, thanks, Noah. And also we can see the chat box. Uh, Adrian have another question for Noah, please. Oh, thank you. I think some, yeah, the APASO. Thank you very much. Yes, um, agent. So, um, in the context of impact work related to, would you recommend us to measure our impact directly, well-being, or would you think it'd be more beneficial to measure the extended impact outcome? Hmm. So what what would be your intervention? So your intervention will be your intervention is on caregivers, right? Yeah, caregiving support navigation. So yeah, of course. So the primary pr primary beneficiaries will be the caregivers. Then you know the secondary beneficiaries will be the 
care recipients. So then, of course, um, I wouldn't be able to tell you what outcomes, uh, you know, we can measure because I would be, what I would do is I would also want to talk to those care, uh, caregivers first. And then I'd also, you know, ask the caregivers, you know, what kind of changes do they um have they um you know have they observed after you know have they observed among their care recipients after joining the program so then i would also start with uh, qualitative studies first okay so um hope i answered the question okay, okay there's another, another question. question is for the student yes from the student um, yeah if the concept of social SR is still at the self-reporting auditing. Uh, thank you very much. Um, social impact measurement. Yes. So a lot of psychosocial, a lot of psychosocial outcome measurement is self, you know, um, often you self-report uh, skills. So in a sense, yes. And um, so I won't be, I, sh I, I shouldn't say like, all those um, social impact measurement and SRI or at self-reporting stage, because some of the outcome or impact metrics, you know, are objective, could be objective, um, observable, ob observable um, uh, variables or metrics, then it doesn't have to be self-reported, right? So for example, income, for example, um, behavioral changes, like addiction, Right, and then so those things can be um, directly measured. So it doesn't have to be self-reported. Um, and auditing, yes. So there's a social, um, um, but I think it's still developing the work. So you can uh, also pay more attention to the um, impact auditing work. And um, I think that this kind of initiative is driven by um, Social Value International. So you can Google a little bit and then try to see uh, what Social Value International is working on when it comes to auditing social impact, okay? And, um, oh, we have another question. Uh, yes, I hope I answer me. your question. Yes. If, you, if I have, if I didn't, please ask more if you ask further questions. Uh, very informative. What are your thoughts on OECD? Uh, So development evaluation, actually all these frameworks are, you know, they kind of make take reference from each other. So develop um, evaluation, they often use significant, um, they use significant change. Uh, well, I think they, the method they use is um, significant change stories. That's also the method I was trying to, um, prom um, I think, promote at the uh, last, in the past two years. So a uh, theory of change itself, you know, um, was also developed at the beginning is for community development work. It actually wasn't developed for, um, you know, individual level intervention, but theory of change as a framework, as approach, um, a group of scholar was looking at, so they were, they were looking at a lot of community development initiatives. And then they also found that all those community in initiatives, they have so many different kinds of activities and then they're creating so many outcomes. And then they don't really know what activity is achieving what outcomes. Basically it's a, it's a network of you know, activities and outcomes. So they are trying to kind of map out the impact pathways. So, so I think the basic methods are quite, uh, quite similar. Yeah. So yeah, I will be looking. So thanks for the question. So I will have to look at the, um, now I will have to look at the framework more in order to answer your question. So right now, because uh, right now I can only answer at the surface level. Yes, you can have uh, the slide. And uh, based on how my pilot evidence be convincing when often seek. Uh, 
how can okay so for the pilot studies it is quite important to be able to tell the funder what kind of research methods you use to derive you know your theory of change so um in a sense that a pilot studies, you can, it's totally okay because oftentimes funders also know like we try different things, we, we conduct different, we try different activities, right? And then, <clears throat> so we need to be able to tell, okay, so these are the methods that we use to actually map out, you know, how those activities make changes and what, and how those activities make changes basically to understand the theory of change and then to understand what features you know what it's it's not about the activity itself it's not about eating together it's not about playing together it's more about how we actually play together how we eat together you know so it's the more about design of those activities right so then we need to be able to use research methods um you know as i recommended use uh you know those critical incident try to look at the design Try to look at the design of, of those activities and then focus on the design of those activities and then see um, whether or not you can identify the patterns or you can identify the common designs or like, uh, uh, the, like uh, the, the shared features of those effective activities. Then you can see, hey, you know, these are the effective designs. And then those, those designs are actually making changes. So, so that's why the change stories can, can be can really come handy, you know, because they can tell you exactly, you know, what designs, you know, what kind of activity, what kind of activity, not activity itself, the design of the activities are making changes. You hope, I hopefully um, um, I'm making sense to you. And um, so the funders, they are, they pay a lot of attention to the research methods. And then once you have that, and then you say, hey, I'm using standard social science research method. What I'm introducing to you is actually very, very standardized social science research. <laughs> you know, we in the social science faculty, we call it mixed methods. So you start with the qualitative uh, stage, with the qualitative stage, and what we often do is quantitate, uh, qual uh, sorry, uh, use a uh, ground theory method. So we develop theory, and then we use quantitative, you know, surveys to actually measure the impact. So it's actually really, um, it's actually really standard social uh, social science research methods. And if you go to so uh, like psychology or social work, you know, um, they will basically give you the same um, advise you the same in the same way. So in, in a sense that so the, hence the funder it will be convincing enough to the funder like hey you know this is basically the methods that we use that this is the scientific research methods we use to build theory of change. This is scientific methods that we use to evaluate impact. Okay. Uh, Laura, uh, I see that there have two questions from Fanky and Naomi. I think that these two questions will be uh, the last the two questions for tonight. Yes. Um, yes. Um, Measuring okay. the change story. Yeah, of course. And uh, we also ask interviewees, you know, um, uh, sometimes any activities you don't like, you know, any activities that really piss you off. So of course, you know, you when you talk to the middle school students, you have to use their language. So, uh, you know, tonight I use very like kind of uh, research terminology, but when you go into the field, when you conduct interview with the middle school students, we, when you conduct interview with papa or uncle, or um, so you got to use their language to put it in a very layman term, right? So um, anything that really happened uh, in a program that made you very unhappy, like piss you off or so. So these are also critical incidents, right? So then some users or some participants will maybe report several activities and then those several activities may share some features again, then you start to they start to see a pattern again, you know, those designs, those uh, program designs probably will lead to a negative change because um, it seems that our participants, are, our users are resisting, you know, are resisting those designs. So then, um, so that's uh, quite important. Yeah, that's a good, very good reminder. So thank you for pointing out. 
um, will be very important to keep in mind since to ensure more reliable. Um, um, I understand like every agency uh, in Hong Kong, different agencies, um, there might be some uh, people from UK as well, I think tonight. And then, um, so I don't wanna say every agency in Hong Kong, I just, you know, different agencies have different ways to collect change stories. And I don't wanna say my way is the best way. So I'm just sharing like, so this is how we collect, you know, how we utilize, you know, a critical incident technique to um, derive the causal link, causal links between effective program design and outcomes. So, and I actually, I'd like to know if, the, if you know better or if you know, um, even a better ways to um to to um to systematically collect change stories to use change uh to utilize change stories to um to develop you know the causal links between program design and outcomes i like to know as well and um of course right now there are so many um big data analytics and social listening analytics so there are so many the, the technology develops so fast i'm sure there will be better ways you know for us to actually to look at to observe you know the link how those activity designs are causing you know are causing the changes i'm sure there will be um um, um methods better methods come out So yeah, so personally, I'm actually not personally me and my team were also looking into the social listening analytics. So, but currently the social listening analytics they can only do sentimental uh, sentiment analysis. They don't really do sentiment analysis on change. So, so we are still waiting, and maybe one day we'll be able to come up with a uh, uh, you know a method to actually uh, a method of analytics to really capture change from uh, text, you know, to use, use text analytics. Oh, God is saying, uh, what is the average? Okay, so so the average length, the length of time, um, so we are very cooperative, me and my team, very cooperative with our client, always founder as well. So some for example, um, some NGOs, they really would like to see the long-term impact. So they would like to see how their, you know, how the existing interventions could have, you know, um, implications for future career development. And then the interventions are for middle school students. So for future career development, imagine. So, so we probably, so then we are actually following the same cohort of the student for five years. So then this is a kind of a long and then, but very short, for example, we also do like assessment for um, for like half year in a sense that the program the program itself lasts for maybe um, for a few days or for months or maybe for a quarter. And then we will do pre and post. And then we try always try to do a follow up, follow up survey. So we try to test the robustness of the impact because we don't want the impact just to go away at you know like uh, right after the intervention we hope that the intervention can at least last for two months you know so but I, again i understand that you know because of budget limit because of um, a lot of uh, constraints you know we can't really the ngos or the funders cannot really entertain our research you know, can can cannot really entertain our researchers. So then we try to be very cooperative and try to work within the time frame of the of the NGOs and time funders. So yeah, it really varies. Okay, so I I think I answered all the questions. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Doctor Noah, to sharing tonight. Before we end the masterclass, may I invite all to fill in a short evaluation form for us? Uh, you may scan the QR code and uh the screen. Uh, check the link in the chat box. Yes. Uh, thank you for all and especially thank Noah tonight. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
is uh, oh, having thank you so much. Very good fun. Thank you so much for having me, and also, really, hopefully, you know,、uh, as a sector, we can grow together. And then I think it shouldn't be a bottleneck, you know.、Um, yeah. So thank you for having me.